Okay, if you have your Bible this morning, go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. And we're continuing our series through this Gospel, verse by verse, and kind of uh, just journeying with Jesus through this Gospel account. And this is, this is going to tie in if, to last week's message, if you are able to watch it online or if you were here uh, the parable of the sea, the soils, the sower, the seed, and the soils. And, and we're going to be referencing that quite a bit, but hopefully if you did miss it, you don't miss a beat either way. But it, it definitely ties into Jesus' teaching. In fact, last week he gave the, the parable, and then there's this little cut scene kind of in, in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus then goes and talks to his disciples and those who were with the disciples. And and he explains the parable to them. But now we're back at the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is in the boat, and he's talking once again to the great crowd, the, the very large crowd. And he says to them, beginning in verse 21, he also said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it to be put on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. By the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And more will be added to you. For whoever has, more will be given to him. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. The kingdom of God is like this, he said. A man scatters seed on the ground, he sleeps and rises night and day, and seed sprouts and grows, although he doesn't know how. The soil produces a crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, and then the full grain on the head. As soon as the crop is ready, he sends for the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable can we use to describe it? like a mustard seed that when sown upon the soil is the smallest of the seeds on the ground. And when sown, it comes up and grows taller than all the garden plants and produces large branches so that the birds of the sky can nest in its shade. He was speaking the word to them with many parables like these as they were able to understand. He did not speak to them without a parable. Privately, however, He explained everything to his own disciples. And there we see this kind of reminder that there was that cut scene where Jesus explains everything. Now, if you're taking notes and you're tracking this, the the parallel passages and the other two synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke, it's kind of partial. It's actually kind of jumbled up in their accounts. Matthew 5, uh, verses 15 and 16, and chapter 13, uh, 31 through 32. And then in Luke, it's Luke 8, 16 through 18, and chapter 13, verses 18 and 19. I've titled this message today, Hidden in Order to Reveal. That sounds really deep because I stole it from a dictionary. No, a a commentary, sorry. It's not not my own, but I read that. I thought that is the perfect way to describe all of what Jesus is saying in in these parables today, that something is hidden and it's meant to be revealed. Now, if you remember last week in the parable of the sower, there is this idea that we are to sow the seed, we're to evangelize, we're to share the word, right? Share the gospel. And it takes root in a person's heart or it's rejected. And and we'll get into that a little more. We'll kind of rehash that at some point. But the gospel, Jesus makes very clear in his explanation to the, the disciples is that it's hidden from those who have hardened their heart towards Christ, who have, hidden, who have uh, hardened their heart towards God in much the same way Pharaoh had in, back in Exodus. They don't want the sharing of the gospel. They're very hard-hearted towards it. Now Jesus is speaking to the same large crowd he was in our text last week. And if you recall, or if you watched online, like I said, That seed was scattered. We don't pick and choose who it goes to, right? It's up to the person to do something with it or the the circumstances they're in and and what God does in their life with the gospel. Now today, what we're looking at really is we're seeing three parables 
two more about seeds, and one about light. And all the parables are, in fact, talking about the effect of the gospel of Jesus in their lives, how it's meant to grow within a person, how it's hidden, and, and, and how it matures. And like I said, he uses three, three parables to illustrate these points, and there are three points for the sermon today, if, you're, if you use those to take notes, the lamp, the growing seed, and the mustard seed. And we're going to notice something along the way. The gospel is always meant to be revealed. And if you're taking notes, you may want to write that down. The gospel is meant to be revealed. Now, some time ago, about three years ago, actually, I was preaching here before I was your pastor, and I talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how so many times we want to just have them at church, right? We want the power of the Holy Spirit to move in the sanctuary. But if you remember last week, I also talked about kind of the vision for Faith Assembly this year is to go outside the, do- the walls, right? Outside our doors. And we're going to sow seed, and we're going to share the Word of God, and we're going to have more of an evangelistic mentality than we've had the last couple of years. And the reason is, not that we haven't had an evangelistic uh, mentality or a, a sharing of the gospel mentality, but we want to really emphasize that and strengthen and equip you to be able to do that where you are because the gospel is meant to be revealed. There will be those who harden their heart. There will be those who reject it, who don't want to hear it. But you know what? We are still called to sow the seed. Amen? And so we look at the first point, the lamp. Jesus says again in, in verse 21, reading it again, says, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it to be put on a lampstand? Now, the Greek literally says here, does the lamp come in in order to be put under a basket or under a bed? It begins with a definite article, not an indefinite article. In other words, the lamp does come in. It is placed inside or it is sewn. You don't really get a chance to cover your ear. Even covering your ears when someone's yelling at you, you can still kind of make out what they're saying, right? When we hear the word of God, we don't really have an option. It either comes in and takes root, or we decide to reject it. And that's kind of what Christ is saying here. The lamp comes in. It's it's, Most translations always say is a lamp brought in, but I'll, I'll get into why it's like that. But Jesus makes it clear the lamp is brought in, and it's not meant to be hidden. In fact, if you were to try and hide one of these lamps, it would be one of two things would happen. You're either going to extinguish the flame and put out the light, or what, what else could happen? Set a fire, and not a good one, right? Fire can be good. It can provide warmth. It can provide heat. Uh, sorry, heat and warmth are the same thing. I meant to say light. Uh, but it can be brought in and cause a lot of problems. The word lamp here is actually, it's referring to, in the Greek, is the word lignos. And it's a lamp that was actually an open-faced bowl an open flame. Now, later, around Jesus' time, there was another type of lamp that you see that goes by the same name, and it's kind of what you see in Disney's Aladdin, only a lot less Robin Williams singing. And the type of basket he's referring to, you would take this bowl of flame, basically, and if you wanted to do this, which would be very foolish, this basket was used for storing grain storing your food. So you would then have to dump out all of your food in order to cover up this lamp. It'd be kind of a dumb thing to do, right? How many of you remember Tupperware? Right? My mom used to sell Tupperware. And boy, did we have a lot of Tupperware. And can I just tell you from about 11-year-old Jeff's memory, Tupperware melts when you try to cover it up, Right? disaster. That would be like a modern day container for food that you're trying to put over a flame. So when you read this in the future, just, just remember burnt plastic. <laughs> and I know that as I read this, that's what comes to mind. You'd be dumping out your lunch and then trying to cause a problem. Now you might put out the flame, but you might also start a fire. Now the type of bed Jesus is referring to, you have to remember Jewish folks, they didn't sleep on beds like we do. They slept on pallets. So this would literally just be a thin mattress type of thing, and they'd roll it up to make more room in their, in their bedroom or living room, wherever they slept, 
And if you were to put that on top of one of these lamps, you'd definitely put out the flame. But they'd also, his audience would have been very familiar with the Roman concept of a bed, which is very similar to what you and I have. It's usually on a frame, sits about this or however high up your frame goes, it sits up off the floor, right? What happens if you put an open fire under your bed? Disastrous fire, right? Now, if any of your house is burned down over the next few weeks, I'm going to let the fire chief know you are not encouraged to try this at home. But it would be foolish to put a lamp under such a thing. We also have to remember that whenever we take the gospel, whenever we take Jesus, and we try to hide it, what will happen? You extinguish the flames. Or disaster. Now with that in mind, we also historically should remember that when the gospel writers were compiling their documents, aside from Matthew and John, they likely weren't doing this from memory. Because again, Mark is getting his account likely from Peter. Luke has gone back, and Luke actually says there were many accounts written about Jesus. So the gospel writers likely compiled a lot of those things. And Matthew, even though he was probably writing from memory, probably read some of those other accounts. In fact, Matthew contains about 90% of Matthew is the Gospel of Mark. So it's very similar. In fact, there's a lot of belief that they, they kind of wrote after each other and off of each other, and that's possible. But they also had the same source material, and they also had this other document that was going around at that time called the Logia. And we don't have access to that today, but it was a collection of the sayings of Jesus and the parables or the words, Logia, Logos, it's the words of Jesus, and they likely used this to make sure they had some kind of continuity between what they were saying. Now, with that said, Matthew and Luke, in their version of this, uh, of this parable, they use an indefinite article, and they say, well, is the, is the lamp brought in? And Mark does not do this. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but that's okay. We have to ask ourselves, why does Mark do this? Well, if you want to understand what Mark is doing here, we have to understand Mark's theology, right? Your life imitates your theology. You've heard me say that since August. What does Mark believe? What is the purpose for his writing? Well, we've seen this since the very beginning of this, of this series. Mark writes for two reasons. One, to show that Jesus came to preach and teach the gospel, but also to destroy the kingdom of Satan. And he makes it very clear that as he does this, he is destroying the works, the kingdom of Satan, under his own authority because he is God. So Mark's not trying to say that this lamp is brought in by somebody else. Mark is saying the, the lamp arrives on its own, that it's put there. I can't make you love Jesus, right? As much as I preach, as much as I teach, I can't make you accept Jesus as your Savior. I can only introduce you to Him. I can only bring the light to you. I can only put the light in your life. And when He arrives in your life, it's a bright, burning flame that illuminates even the darkest corners of your soul. Now here's this connection. This is what Mark is doing. There's this connection the Gospel writers want us to see. In the Old Testament, what was a lamp? Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light on my path. This word, this idea of a lamp and the word are tied together throughout Scripture. Now, the, the, Jesus has come along and he's kind of providing this new revelation as to what or who the word or the lamp actually is. In fact, Mark is identifying Jesus with that lamp and similarly with the word, right? Right? What's the word? The Logos? We see this in where else? In John's gospel. They're linked together. Like I said, they all had the same source material. They all harmonize with one another. And so John begins his gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And we know when he says word, he's not talking about scripture, he's talking about Jesus. He will later use the pronoun he, referring to the word, as if it's a person. So we know he's talking about Jesus. And just a little bit further down the page, he says that light, referring to Jesus, shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He's talking about John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, 
but he came to testify about the light, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And he's talking about Jesus. So the word and the light, they're tied together, right? Mark spells this out completely in verses 22 and 23. There's nothing hidden that will not be revealed and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. Now, this is going to point us back to last week's message in that it is always God's intention to expose. It is always God's intention to explain and illuminate and bring some kind of understanding to those who seek him. If you remember, Jesus explains his parable of the sower. We know from our text that I read a moment ago, the whole text, Jesus will explain these things to his disciples. <clears throat> Whoa, my voice just cracked like I was 14 again. Sorry about that. Better drink a cup of coffee. Not the whole cup. Now, if you remember, a parable without an explanation is a riddle. Jesus, being the lamp, being the light, this is the theme that those who remain in the light, there's nothing hidden inside of them. Again, John is going to flesh this out as well in one of his epistles, 1 John 1, verses 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. There is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In Jesus, nothing is meant to remain hidden. His light exposes all your dark thoughts, all your dark deeds, all of your secret sins. In, in Christ, if you truly let Christ in, he will expose those things. If to nobody else, to yourself, so that you may confess them and repent of them and be forgiven. That's what, he's, that's what he does. And again, I mentioned before earlier, and I mentioned last week, Jesus' parables were meant for those who wanted to be close to him, who wanted to seek his presence, who wanted to be near him and understand him and have their hearts toward him, not those who have their hearts hardened. And the idea is that all hearts would turn toward him, but there are, there are going to be those who don't, those who will one day, they're going to be without an excuse because everything's going to be revealed at that time. Revelation 20 tells us the books will be opened and, and they're going to be judged by him. And anyone whose name, this is Revelation 20, verse 15, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The point of that is simply you are either in the light or you are choosing to be in darkness. Pretty weighty thing on a Sunday morning, but there it is. At the end of this parable, it seems as though Jesus has, has told this, he's made this very clear, and he's talking about the, the lamp, but then he seems to almost slam on the brakes. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. By the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and more will be added to you. For whoever has, more will be given to him. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. He says, pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention in the Greek is only one word. It's the word blepete, and it means be watchful. Watch out. One commentator said, watch what you hear. And when you think about that statement, it's kind of a ridiculous statement, isn't it? You cannot see sounds unless you've drank 20 cups of coffee and a Red Bull. Some of you will get that later. Um, but pay attention to what you're taught. It's a metaphor. Pay attention to what you humor, what you listen to. This goes beyond just chewing the meat and spitting the bones. Don't let someone's bad teachings corrupt you. That's literally what he's talking about here. I know some people, Pastor Jeff, you, you spend a lot of time talking about false teachers and you call people, so did Jesus, so did Paul, so did John, so did James, so did Jude. I'll keep, you want, I can keep going. So did Elijah. All right, I'm done. It's, it's what the, the pastor, it's what a good shepherd should do. And Jesus is warning his flock one more time, be very careful what you listen to, what you allow to impact your beliefs, to impact how you live. To illustrate this further, Jesus begins to talk about uh, the measure we use, what, the, the measure with what we use to 
hear. In other words, what do you do with what you hear? Do you absorb it? Do you take it with you? Or do you reject it? Now, some commentators and some scholars think Jesus is talking about money here. He's not. The context clearly shows he's not doing that. But he talks about money elsewhere and other places. So it's not to say that Jesus doesn't talk about money. That's not what the context is saying. He says one more thing that he had said previously last week. He says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. And do you remember last week when you see Jesus say this, if you have ears to hear, listen, what he's saying is if you heard and you understood what I'm talking about, then go and do what I told you. That's the point of what he's getting at there. He's telling his followers, watch out. Pay attention to what you hear. Be discerning. Be deliberate in your quest for knowledge. And we should, as Christians, we should have a quest for knowledge. Because the more we seek to know Christ and know about Christ, the more we grow in Christ, the more we grow in his truth, the more we fill our minds with the things of Christ, the closer we will get to him and appreciate and understand him. And the more we fill our minds with things that mock him or copy but are not him, the more we invite in decay and rot into our soul. This reiterates once again the fact that we should seek to understand Jesus and who he is. Again, you've heard me say it since August. Our life imitates our theology. What you believe about Jesus will dictate how you live for Jesus. It will dictate how you share Jesus or if you share Jesus. If you don't think that highly of something, what do you do? You don't talk about it, right? I watched the new Spider-Man. Sorry, guys, I left you. I went on my own. It was awesome. I told all my friends. You know what I have a hard time talking about with my friends? Jesus. Conviction right there. Because I like Spider-Man more than I like Jesus? No, absolutely not. But what matters to me enough to tell them that it should matter to them? By the way, I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but... No, we're going to reschedule. It's the same way. The gospel is meant to be shared because the gospel should matter to us. Jesus should matter to us to the point we share it. I just, I always find this funny. I'm, I'm going way off my notes here. There was a study done a few years back. It said 94% of Americans will listen to you talk about your faith if it matters to you. But so many times we treat the 94 like the 6%, don't we? They may not accept it. They may reject it, but they will listen. And what does that mean? The lights come in. They can put it under a basket. They can put it under their bed. They can extinguish it all they want, but the light was there. They have no excuse. Here's the flip side. One out of the four times in our, in our message last week, one out of the four times, what happened? It took root, and it produced fruit 30, 60, 100 times more. No, don't be afraid to share the gospel. And I'm preaching to myself today as much as I am anyone else. Second, we see the growing seed, the parable of the growing seed. Jesus continues in verse 26, The kingdom of God is like this. A man scatters seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day. The seed sprouts and grows, although he doesn't know how. Now, like I said last week, Matthew talked about the parable of the sower, and, and I misspoke. I said Mark lightly touches, lightly touches on another parable that Matthew men- mentions, but he doesn't. Actually, I, like I said, I misspoke. G- Mark uses a completely different parable altogether. Matthew's talking about the parable of the wheat and the weeds. Mark is using the parable of the growing seed. Now, these are two totally, Mar- this is exclusive to Mark. Now, if Matthew has 90% of the book of Mark in it, in his account, and Luke has used Mark as a reference for writing his gospel in some points, but Mark says something different, we should pay attention, right? This is an important parable. There's a very deep fact to be taken in here. Now, in the parable of the sower, just a few uh, paragraphs earlier, Jesus explains the responsibility of those who hear the gospel. And he just got done telling us about the, the lamp, someone uh, somewhat explaining the believer's responsibility to give the light and take the light and plant the light somewhere else. 
But now Jesus begins to speak about the kingdom of God and how it comes to earth. Now you have to remember, Jesus does this against the backdrop of what the Jewish people saw as the coming Messiah. They saw Jesus coming to be this warrior king, right? He was coming like David. David was a warrior king. He was a musician. He was all these great things. He was, and they expect someone like that to come along, to rise up. You remember, it wasn't an easy rise up for David either, but they had it in their mind that the Messiah was going to do that. Instead, what they get is this very humble carpenter slash rabbi who's teaching things they don't like. And so we see this backdrop, Jesus trying to teach this, nowhere greater, their mockery of him, their misunderstanding of him, we see it nowhere greater than at the foot of the cross. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him and said, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. That's Matthew 27. In other words, if you're the powerful Messiah you claim to be, do this one last miracle. Get off the cross. That's their image of what Jesus was supposed to be. The truth was, he was able to do that. If you remember, he told Peter, he said, do you think for one second I couldn't call upon my father and he wouldn't send 12,000, 12 legions of angels to come and save me? He was able to do that. But the idea of the Messiah and the Jewish mentality was that he was coming to overthrow Rome. That he was going to bring freedom from Rome. Excuse me one second. But Jesus didn't come to overthrow Rome. He came to overthrow Satan. That's what, Matt, that's what Mark has been making very clear. He could have got off that cross. He could have marched to Rome and taken down Caesar. Or he could stay on the cross, be resurrected in order for the devil, for sin, and for death to finally be defeated. And so he made his choice. He submitted to the plan of the Father. And so Jesus is revealing this, uh, this idea of the kingdom of heaven and the strong message that we're seeing here, the seed is once again scattered on the ground, but it's hidden for a while. There's this mystery around it that it will be revealed. Eventually, the seed becomes a plant, and then we see a harvest. But there's a progression to that growth within the soil. And What, what did the soil represent in the last parable? The human heart, right? Mark goes on, verse 28, Jesus said, The soil produces a crop by itself, First the blade, then the head, and then the full head, uh, sorry, the full grain on the head. There's this progression. We saw this last week the putting down of roots, the growing strong, the maturity of the believer. Now, Paul speaks quite a bit about the maturity of the believer. In 1 Corinthians 3, he says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready because you're still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not? worldly and behaving like mere humans. And eventually the Corinthians get it. And they shape up and they start to grow. They start to mature. But a better portion to illustrate what Paul's saying about Christian maturity is actually found in Ephesians 4. Paul calls upon the believers to grow together. He says, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling You've received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And then he's going to conclude this thought. He's going to say, then we will no longer be what? Little children. They will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow 
in every way into him who is the head, Christ, from him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. The maturing process, what Paul is saying is, is that it happens as we get together, as we grow together. You know, in American culture, we have such an idol of self, of, of identity and individuality, don't we? I mean that. We, we worship at the altar of self in our country. We have personality tests, and I might, I'm going to be careful because I could go off on a rant for a while about this. We have personality tests that are intended to review, reveal your true self. You get them on Facebook. I wouldn't take those to your counselor and say, hey, this is what Facebook tells me. We also have the Enneagram and the Briggs-Meyer, all these other things. But who fills out those questions and answers to find out what personality type you are? You do, right? So what happens? You get the results and you go, oh my goodness, this explains who I am. Well, of course it does. You're the one that answered the question. All it does, all these personality tests, Define you by the lies you've told yourself. We are not who some personality tells a personality test tells us we are. We are who we are in Christ. Nothing else should dictate that. But here's my favorite. We get told to live our truth, right? Georgette, live your truth. Doesn't matter what her truth is. That's what. Don't do that, by the way. I'm just using you as an example. Thank you, but. Yeah, I, I know I, I talked about Spider-Man a second ago. Here's another one. I know you guys don't, most of you don't get into this, uh, the Marvel shows on Disney Plus and things. But there's a show called WandaVision. And it's so stupid. I'm sorry. It, it was the wor- I, I think it was one of the worst comic book adaptations of anything I ever watched. This is your pastor speaking as a nerd for a second. Okay, bear with me. But here's the thing. In the comic books, Wanda Maximoff is a villain. She becomes a good guy, then she kind of goes back to being a villain again. That's what they do in this story. She has the power to alter reality. That's a a scary power for somebody who has very uh, bad mental health to have, right? And she ends up going, she gets very upset, and she enslaves an entire town and forces them to do things against their will. Nothing necessarily bad, they just uh, reenact I Love Lucy episodes and Brady Bunch episodes. She takes them through television, his, historical television shows and stuff. And, and it's kind of funny and it's cutesy. But all through this show, in almost every episode, without fail, some character comes along and says, Wanda, live your truth. Let me tell you something. Wanda's doing it and she's enslaved an entire town. She's the villain of this story. She's the bad guy. Because when you live your truth, that's what you do. You in You enforce your truth on other people. But it's the idol of self being worshipped all over again. And eventually, critics said, this is a great show. Is it really? The villain wins? She she took these people and made them do whatever she wanted them to do. That's not what a hero does. Hero comes along and tries to liberate those people. It's an immature way of thinking, and it's, it's the way our society is, is teaching us and our kids to think about themselves and about the world around them. It's a very selfish way to think. That's not what Christ tells us. Christ doesn't say, live your truth. What's he say? We sang it in a song today. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The immature believer thinks they can do it by their self. It's a foolish believer who thinks he can do this alone without other believers and around him encouraging him and, and challenging and, and discipling him. People who help us mature as we grow together. I like the way John Brodus talks about this passage. He's a minister from the late 1800s and He wrote a commentary on the Gospel of Mark, and he said, The man casts wheat upon the earth and then cannot make it grow. He goes on regularly, sleeping by night and rising by day, and the seed goes on regularly, producing the blade, the ear, the full-grown grain. But he cannot control the process, does not even understand it. 
He knows not how. The he being very emphatic. God knows, but not he. He who sowed can only observe and wait till he perceives that there is wheat ready to be gathered. So it is with sowing religious truth. We cannot make it grow. God gives the increase. Again, this ties back to the message last week. All we can do is plant the soil, or plant the seed in the soil. It's up to the person who receives that to decide what will happen with it, and God grows what he will. The message is that the truth has to be given to all. The gospel must be revealed to as many people as possible, there's, if there's to be a harvest. And when the harvest is ready, Jesus says, as soon as the crop is ready, he sends for the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, we want a harvest, right? We're Pentecostal. By the way, the, the festival of Pentecost, the feast of Pentecost that takes place in, after, in Acts chapter 2, is about the harvest. It was a harvest festival. It's kind of interesting considering Jesus kept telling the disciples, bring in the harvest, right? As you sow the seed, and he's using all these analogies, of farming analogies about bringing in the harvest. And we see the harvest, and we think revival. And we want that. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, Jesus said, like just referenced, that the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. But that's not what Jesus is referring to here. If you remember, parables are given in judgment. And what he's doing is he's actually linking backward to the, to the prophet Joel and linking ahead to Revelation, uh, Revelation 20. I'll get to that, or sorry, 14. I'll get to that in a second. Joel 3.13 says, Swing the sickle because the harvest is ripe. Come and trample the grapes because the wine press is full. The wine vats overflow because the wickedness of the nations is extreme. It's a judgment. And then ahead in Revelation 14, Then I look and there was a white cloud, and one like the Son of Man was seated on the cloud. We know that's Jesus. With a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand, Another angel came out of the temple crying out in a loud voice to the one who was seated on the, on the cloud, use your sickle and reap, for the time to reap has come since the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. All three of these passages link together. There, I said this last week, we are all under judgment. We are either under the wrath of God or the blood of God. One of those two things. And the events of Revelation 14 are talking about a judgment that takes place during the seven-year tribulation as those who are mature in Christ are harvested either through martyrdom or intense persecution, which is something else Jesus is preparing his disciples for along the way. He's explaining to them, if you're going to share the gospel in the world that Jesus lives in, you have to be willing to suffer and die the way Jesus suffered and died. Many of them did. In the same way, the gospel grows in us. We must be willing to share it. We must be willing to accept the consequences of it if it's to be revealed. And finally, we see the mustard seed parable, verse 30. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable can we use to describe it? Well, first of all, who is we? Right? You ever read that and go, is, 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 what, what's happening? We kind of want to read it. We, we might begin to think of, Jesus saying, we, as if he's speaking in the, as the full triune God in this moment. Like in Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. But we have to be very careful to not over-spiritualize some things in Scripture. Many, actually, all of Scripture, we have to be careful with. Remember, he's talking to his disciples. And his disciples are going to go, and they're going to be the ones who then have to explain the kingdom of God. They're the ones who are getting the words of Jesus, and they're going to have to take the words of Jesus to Greece and the rest of the world all around the Mediterranean, all, as far as Spain and India, right? And they're going to have to explain this. So what Jesus is really doing here, he's teaching them how to think about the kingdom of heaven. He's teaching them how to explain it. It's what good teachers do. Everybody has experienced this. At least those of you who've gone to a public kindergarten. At least maybe, maybe you didn't have a good teacher, but at some point in your education, you probably did. I remember I, I was in kindergarten, I was coloring a bunny rabbit blue. See a lot of blue bunny rabbits? No, but I wanted a blue bunny rabbit for some reason. 
And my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Phillips, she's passed away. She's a great lady, very gracious. She comes up and she looks at me coloring this thing. And I was getting into it, just coloring crayon. And uh, she says, Jeff, you see a lot of blue bunny rabbits? No. Well, what color are bunny rabbits? Brown. Well, why don't we color him brown? I want a blue bunny rabbit. It's a different story. Okay, but you see what she was doing, right? She's making me think about it, and that's what Jesus is doing. When he's saying we, he's, he's letting them join in to the teaching process because they're going to be explaining this. They're going to be teaching this. So Jesus asks this question, and then he answers it. He says, it's like a mustard seed when sown upon the soil is the smallest of all the seeds on the ground. And when sown, it comes up and grows taller than all the garden plants, and produces large branches so the birds of the sky can nest in its shade. Now, why would Jesus use a mustard seed? Well, he tells us. One of the smallest, uh, it's an incredibly small seed. Now, it's not the smallest seed in the world, obviously, but it would have been the smallest seed that his audience in Capernaum would have been familiar with. And it's a beautiful analogy. It's very. It's actually a very deep analogy. On the one hand, the mustard seed could be used as a condiment for food, but it's also medicinal. It has a lot of medicinal purposes. Ambrose of Milan would write in the fourth century, he said, its seed is indeed very plain and of little value, but if bruised or crushed, it shows forth its power. So faith first seems a simple thing, but if it is bruised by its enemies, it gives forth proof of its power so as to fill others who hear or read of it with the odor of its sweetness. In other words, when persecution comes, we find out how deep our roots go. When things get very difficult and the, the trials seem to rise up, we find out how high we can rise. The mustard seed, this illustration Jesus is making here, while it's very small, it rises, it grows, and it's unseen at first, but eventually it's going to be so big, so tall, that the birds of the air are going to come and find shelter within it. And this is, again, this is Jesus linking us back to the Old Testament. His audience, especially the scribes and the Pharisees, would have understood this. The phrase is going to recall this idea of the Gentiles coming into the kingdom of God. We see it first in Ezekiel 17, I will plant it on Israel's high mountain, that would have been Jerusalem, so that it may bear branches, produce fruit, and become a majestic cedar. Birds of every kind will nest under it, taking shelter in the shade of its branches. And later, Ezekiel 31, it says, All the birds of the sky nested in its branches, and all the animals of the field give birth beneath its bows, and all the great nations lived in its shade. Jesus is saying, the kingdom is for everybody. The kingdom is for anyone, not just Israel, but all the nations, anyone whose heart wants to seek this. Why? Because God is king over all his creation. The kingdom is the entire sphere of salvation where People may come and find shelter, find protection. That's the Psalms. Sing of that. God is my refuge. God is my shield. God is my banner, and so on. These two seed parables, they're, they're pointing us back again to last week's message and the sower. When the sower sowed the seed, as he sowed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. When the sun came, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it didn't produce fruit. Still other seed fell on good ground, and it grew up producing fruit that increased 30, 60, and 100 times. Of course, I spent an hour unpacking that last week. You can find it on our YouTube channel if you really want to fall asleep early today. Um, but it's part of the mystery of God's word, how we share it, how we scatter the seed. We don't control where it takes root. In fact, Jesus said, all we do, the sower sows the word. It's all you do with it. You cannot force someone to get saved. You should not ever manipulate someone to come to an altar call and pray the sinner's prayer so you can tick a box on your accomplishments for the week. We can't do that because that's not how they stay saved. Some hearts will hear it and soon reject it because Satan will deceive them. Some will receive it with joy even. They'll get excited. They'll bear a little bit of fruit. But when the time comes, they fall apart because they have no roots. Others are going to hear it and the distractions, the worries of this life, or the deceitfulness of wealth will kill them. 
Jesus said, those like seeds sown on good ground hear the word, welcome it, and produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 times what was sown. He uses all these parables, the parables within this chapter, to demonstrate how we are to evangelize, how we are to mature, how we are to grow, how we are to share and let our light, the light of Christ in us, shine in the world around us. Yet there will be those who don't want to receive it. And so he finishes this portion of Scripture. He says, He was speaking the word to them with many parables like these as they were able to understand. He did not speak to them without a parable. Privately, however, he explained everything to his own disciples. Again, this this clarifies something we saw last week. There are those who hear the parables and want to understand them. There are those who hear the parables and seek Jesus and want an answer and want to come closer to him. But there are always going to be those who reject what was said, who don't want to hear it, who harden their hearts and remain on the outside. The Apostle Paul references this later in his letter to the Romans. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. And you are used by God to share his gospel, to shine that light, or you should be used that way, willing to do that. We share it so that those on the outside might receive Christ, that they might grow in him, that, they, that the word might take root. The light is meant to shine. I'm going to move to close in just a moment, but the gospel is meant to be revealed. Before we close, I just want to challenge you this morning. I'm, I'm not going to do a, a full altar call. If you do want prayer or you want to come and pray, you are more than welcome to. But I'd ask you to stand with me this morning as we close in prayer together. And I want to challenge you this morning with two things. One, ask yourself, am I sharing Jesus? Simple yes or no question. And then ask yourself, what am I doing if I'm not? Because we'll share things that matter to us, if Jesus matters to us, if we believe he was who he says he was, he says he is, then we will share him. We will let that light shine in the darkness. Secondly, ask yourself, am I conforming to Christ? When people see me, do they see someone who loves Jesus or do they see someone they can't distinguish from the rest of the world? What am I doing to set myself apart? What am I doing to, how are my actions preaching the gospel if my words aren't? This morning, challenge yourself with that. Get alone in prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to search you. Ask the Holy Spirit to seek your heart and just expose what's going on in there as far as your attitude towards evangelism because clearly we are meant to share and sow the seed of the word of God. Father, this morning, I just thank you because you are faithful, even when we are not. And you will give us opportunity this week, and maybe even after we leave here, to share your word, speak your truth in the darkness, Lord. I pray you are glorified through it all. Jesus, you said you will build your church, and I believe the ball is rolling. The gears are turning. And Lord, this is a body on the move. But Father, I pray that we are faithful to you. Faithful to the sharing of your word. Faithful to the gospel. Lord, as we leave today, keep us safe on the roads. Keep us warm. But most importantly, keep us in you, Father. Lord, we love you. We worship you today. And we ask all of this again in Jesus' name, in accordance with your will.